What's exciting is when you see where, where this company started, the tie. You see what it's become. It's all been driven by a consistent vision and actually a consistent purpose. It started 56 years ago with a tie. Today, Ralph Lauren is one of the world's most iconic fashion brands, valued at more than $8 billion, with 500 stores around the globe. At the helm, a chief executive who came into the job seven years ago, with no fashion experience, but a determination to return the brand to luxury, attracting younger, high-value customers. When I started in this job, I often got the question, Patrice, says, is Ralph Lauren still relevant? Right? Which is a painful question to listen to, honestly. Um, but we, we had, to some extent, lost touch with that younger generation. In this episode of Leaders with L'Aqua, I speak to Patrice Louvet about the company's founder, Ralph Lauren, and Louvet's plans to take the company back to its roots. Patrice Louvet, thank you so much for joining us on Bloomberg. Very happy to be here, Francine. Do you have the best job in the world? Pretty close. <laughs> because it's fun. What, what was the most surprising thing about your job since you first started? Oh, there's so many things. You know, the, probably the thing that actually attracted me to this opportunity is the opportunity to work with Ralph, right? The, this man is visionary, incredible entrepreneur, has had an amazing success around the world, and the opportunity to work with him, to partner with him, is really special, and I cherish it every day. Yeah, and you have to get along, because of course he's, you know, he's still such a figure. He has his name on the door. He does have his name so on the door. So how much of it is his vision? Well, it all starts with his vision, right? And what's exciting is when you see where, where this company started, the tie, you see what it's become. It's all been driven by a consistent vision and actually a consistent purpose. You and I talked this about our purpose is to inspire the dream of a better life through authenticity and timeless style. And that's been the driving force for the company now. And now we're around the world. We are well beyond ties. As you know, we're in hospitality. We have restaurants. We have coffee shops. We're in the women's business, the homes business, but all still driven by a very consistent vision, ambition. And this is an industry that's very much about trends. And Ralph actually regularly says, I hate fashion because fashion comes and goes. And we talk a lot about style, mm -hmm. timelessness, and element of consistency. And I think that's served the company quite well over the past 50 plus years. And what was it like the first time you met him? Uh, it was, there was a moment that was incredibly special. So I got a chance to see him in his ranch in Colorado in Telluride. Before you got the job or after? Uh, right after I got the job. Um, so I, so that, that's probably the most iconic moment for me. And I, I can also give you perspective on, on that first engagement. But we're in his ranch. We're outside. It's chilly. It's 8 in the morning next to the cookhouse. And we're looking ahead. And there's this beautiful mountain view. And we're talking about what business are we in? Right, because it was really important to be super clear together and have a consistent ambition. And we landed on the fact we're actually in the dreams business. A lot of people say, well, Ralph Lauren, you're in the apparel business. You're a fashion company. No, we would disagree with that. So is it trust? Is he easy to work with? He's wonderful to work with. There's always this image of, you know, the creative leader in a fashion company can be challenging and complicated. And, uh, and there's obviously been stories around that. But R Ralph is, uh, is an incredible partner. He is both an amazing visionary and a great businessman. I think that's been a key part of his success. We have been super clear on our respective mm -hmm. roles. And although nothing is written on a piece mm -hmm. of paper, we're clear on who's in responsible for yeah. what and where we come together. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't be happier with, her, happier with the partnership. I mean, Patrice, th there was also a moment where you had to basically you know, change the company to get away from the department stores that, that lowered the, the ambition for the company. How right. hard was that? It's, it, it, from a financial standpoint, it's challenging. But if you go back to the roots of this company, uh, the, the, this company was founded as a luxury company. Right? And actually, the first tie that Ralph launched, he reminded me recently, was I think two and a half times the price of a Christian Dior tie. Right? And I think no one would disagree that Christian Dior is an incredible luxury company. So we indeed had to significantly pull back, particularly in the US, our presence, because the brand had been overextended. We reduced about 2 thirds of our wholesale doors. Um, but as I look now, we're about two, three years into that exercise. We're in a much stronger place. Yeah. Our brand perception is much stronger. Our value perception is much stronger. But the, the elevation journey or the, this ultra luxury at the time was not necessarily a given. Right now, it, when you look at luxury company, it's very clear that if you, you know, mm. are in the ultra luxury space, so you can increase prices. You have a lot more of a market around the world it, instead of this like moderate luxury. What made right. you see that back then? I think it's back to what this company stood for historically. Uh, and already at the time, I mean, this phenomenon has been going on for a, a while that you see this bifurcation. Yeah. 
of, of brands, luxury brands that have pricing power, that consumers yeah. see the value, and therefore you have the ability to increase your average unit retail, and others where it's are just focused on selling product, not engaging the consumer in the same way, much more promotional. We felt like, you know, as we go back to our roots, that's that's where we wanted to take the company. I mean, how, how do you create that that fortune? So, how do you create those moments where people associate you with Wimbledon or some of the shows mm. that they watch on TV that again elevates the luxury? Yeah, it's a, and it's a, it's a it's a very holistic exercise. So, it's not just one thing. Is there one thing that you think works better than others? Is it the the flagship stores? that are very, you know, with have coffee shops and have a very distinct lifestyle that you think people are drawn to more than online? Yeah, for us, we, the way we think about it, Francine, is 30 key cities around the world. So we actually don't really look at markets, we look at key cities. And each, each key city, we want to have a balanced ecosystem. Start with a flagship store that really is gonna project the image. Our approach in China, for example, is very much driven by the city focus, Establish a strong flagship, and then build the ecosystem around it. But I, I you know, I, I don't know that I can point to just one intervention. I think the transformation of our marketing and storytelling mm -hmm. has also been quite effective, particularly at recruiting a younger consumer. That was one of our priorities when which I started. Which is the hardest, right? Which is the hardest because they're fickle and and they change and exactly. And then there's obviously a lot, a lot of opportunities. And, and I remember when I started in this job, the, I often got the question. Patrice, is, is Ralph Lauren still relevant, right? Which is no. a painful question to listen to, honestly. Um, but we, we had, to some extent, lost touch with that younger generation. And this company is 56 years old, and we expect to be here another 56 years from now. So yeah. critical to kind of rejuvenate our customer base. And we pivoted our marketing to be where that younger consumer is. Gaming, the types of sports activation that resonates with them, right? Uh, Styling the product differently. What's very interesting is our, our white polo shirt, which is one of our icons. Mm. You have 80-year-old men wearing it, 40-year-old women wearing it, 16-year-old kids wearing it. Same product, but we style it differently. And I wonder whether, I mean, is your secret sauce also that you're, you're the right lifestyle brand for the right moment? Because it's not, you know, people don't go to haute couture events anymore, or, mm. or less they're, they have a, a more relaxed approach even when they come to the office. Yeah, uh, hopefully more than the, just this moment, <laughs> Francine, because we want to be here for another 50 years. But I do think what Ralph and the teams have been able to create over time is indeed that lifestyle proposition that is not dependent. You know, we're not handbag experts, or we're yeah. not outerwear experts, or we're not sneaker experts. We offer a lifestyle, and we offer this range of product. And indeed, as we've seen people still working from home partly, coming back to the office, going back to social events, mm -hmm. We have this ability to serve you with a more athleisure-driven mm -hmm. type of proposition. So are we, are we going to the office in hoodies now? Has, has work well, from home uh, changed us? Uh, I'm it in depends. a tuxedo, so maybe I not guess, if you're Francie, on TV. It, maybe it depends <laughs> which industry you're in. I think uh, at Ralph Lauren, I haven't seen many people in hoodies, but Ralph does come in once in a while in, in a double RL hoodie or a polo oh. hoodie, but he makes it look beautiful, as you can imagine. Up next, Patrice Louvet on raising prices, ambitions in Asia, and why sustainability is key. You can't expect to be timeless if we're run out of resources. So for me, uh, sustainability is not a side activity. It's not uh, a reaction to external pressure. It's core to who we are, what we stand for. And to a very strong extent, it's about future-proofing our business. Ralph Lauren has raised the average price of its products by around 80% since 2018, as it aims to elevate its brand and become a lifestyle luxury company, something the chief executive is passionate about. I continue the conversation with Patrice Louvet. When you look at pricing, you've also mm. been able to really elevate um, the, the brand by increasing prices. Is there a limit to how much you, know, you can increase prices by before it hurts demand? Our <laughs> average unit retail. Indeed, is up about oh, close to 80% now since we started on this journey. Uh, short answer is I don't think there's a limit as long as we do a good job on elevating the product, elevating the storytelling, elevating the environment, making sure that the consumer sees the value, and they have so far. Our value perception actually are the highest they've been since we've been tracking it. But the onus is on us to make sure that we are able to provide this consistent elevation. 
as the consumer sees it, then that'll support the continued growth of average unit retail. Yeah, talk to me about China. Yes. So China has a huge potential, but it's actually qu still quite a small market for you. It is still small for us. Yeah, huge short, right. mid, and long-term potential for us. So it's about 6% of the company today. That's double what it was uh, three, four years ago, but still in absolute quite small when you look at the penetration of the Chinese business for some of the best luxury players in the industry that are 20, 30, 40%. So I'm excited about the opportunities and the runway. What's really uh, energizing for us in China is how the brand is connecting with that younger consumer and that more elevated consumer. I mean, we sell, uh, oddly enough, but I think it's a result of all the elevation work the teams have done, our, our most elevated products we sell best in China. We have the best gender balance, as, yep. as uh, I believe you know, most of our business historically has been more men. Yep. In China, it's a good balance, men, women. And it's a relatively young consumer, late 20s, early 30s. So it's, a good, it's actually a good example for us for the rest of the world. We're yep. being very deliberate in our approach in China. So not, we could grow faster, yep. but we want to do it in a quality way, so we're building the brand so that serves us well five years from now, mm -hmm. 10 years from now, but I'm very excited about uh, just because more generally Asia and China. So but you, are, are you worried that, that you dilute the brand if you become too big yes. in China too quickly? Yes, I think the notion of desirability is critical yeah. for this industry, and there is some element of exclusivity that's important mm -hmm. to support it, and I think that's why we pulled back in the U.S., where we felt like we had over-distributed and, okay. uh, and become, to some extent, ubiquity is, can, can be a challenge in the luxury space, yeah. Not to some extent. It is a challenge it's in the luxury space, and you want to stay unique and special. That's what we're building in markets like China, and even as we look yeah. ahead to markets like India, which are promising for the future, yeah. being very deliberate on planting the right foundation so we can build from there with the right image perception. So the, the world is changing. We talk about AI all the time. We talk, of course, about sustainability and the need for fashion companies to do more. Yes. How much time do you spend thinking about sustainability? A lot. And I'll tell you why. I go back to our conversation on purpose earlier, right? Inspire the dream of a better life through timelessness um, and, and uh, authentic style. Timelessness and sustainability go together, right? You can't expect to be timeless if we're run out of resources. So for me, uh, sustainability is not a side activity. It's not uh, a reaction to external pressure. It's core to who we are, what we stand for. And to a very strong extent, it's about future-proofing our business, right? You need to focus on sustainability to recruit. Yep. More and more, the, that younger consumer we're talking about, they want to work for companies that care about this planet, that do more than just kind of generate revenue and, and profit. You need sustainability to attract consumers. More and more, including that younger consumer, they care deeply about what are you doing differently? Yep. How are you making a difference? Yep. Investors, particularly in Europe, more and more place value on what you're doing in sustainability. Many of our partners have expectations but on sustainability. What does that look like for, for a, a luxury lifestyle company? Ah, so for us, it's multidimensional. Um, right now, we're putting a lot of emphasis on circularity. Mm -hmm. And I actually think if we're able to shift the business model in fashion from linear to circular, that's probably one of the biggest changes we can make that has the greatest impact. Now, obviously, that's a total ecosystem you have to impact, but it's to give you examples. It's innovating how we design. So we've just launched a, the first cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified cashmere sweater. It's innovating in materials. It's innovating in, with the processors. There's a company called Reverso in Italy, for example, that helps us with recycling yep. cashmere. And then it's leveraging industry scale, because I think in sustainability, we can't go it alone. So, but do you sell differently to the Chinese that, than you do to the, to the American consumers? In, in terms of lifestyle, or is it still the, the, the similar lifestyle? I think the fundamentals of our lifestyles and the different kind of movies that, yep. that we showcase, different stories that we tell are pretty consistent. Um, if anything, just in the way that consumers kind of dress and engage with fashion brands, on average, this is a generalization, but on average, the Chinese consumer, just like the Japanese or Korean consumer, tends to be more elevated and sophisticated in, in the, the types of styles that they put yep. together. So that informs part of our buy and our product, but okay. fundamentally... So what, more innovative, more, it's, it's not necessarily more edgy, it's more luxurious? No, it's, uh, it's more, more luxurious, yeah. It's, it's actually more, uh, more elevated and, and more luxurious. I mean, what, what's amazing is also there seems to be a trend, and you may, may be one of the first ones, to you know, get chief executives from parts of the industry that mm. weren't luxury and fashion, that were actually consumer products. I, is there a parallel? Do, do, you know, do consumer products, chief, chief executives do better than luxury? 
Oh, that's a big statement. <laughs> a big I'm not <laughs> going to answer that question directly. Um, you know, this trend started in beauty, actually. If you kind of rewind the tapes, beauty is where you started to see CPG consumer uh, uh, professional kind of come yeah. in yeah. first. And now we're seeing that in, in the fashion world. Um, I think at the end of the day, success in this industry is getting the balance right between magic and logic. Okay. And so obviously the fashion industry, the creative leaders have the magic. There's an opportunity to bring a higher level of logic without diluting the magic. And I think what people from the consumer goods industry bring are greater focus on the consumer, mm -hmm. understanding the consumer. Now, I think where, where you get success is designer vision, customer needs come together, and then right. that's where things get, get uh, explosive. So greater understanding of the consumer, more data, more experience, leveraging data and decision making. Again, there's an element of intuition yeah. that needs to be yeah. protected, but that can be supplemented by data. Well, what's the, the ideal algorithm to where to put a store? Uh, it's confidential, <laughs> I can't tell you. <laughs> you'd, you'd have to kill me. But after. We, I would have to, no, I wouldn't do that, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, we, do look at, we do look at a number of metrics, whether that's uh, obviously consumer profile, whether that's competitive yeah. environment, whether that's the type of products yeah. that are being sold, sold in the area. And then the last thing I would point to is operational discipline. I mean, these are complex businesses, oh. right? We develop a lot of SKUs every year, complex supply chains. And I think what you learn in the consumer goods industry is how to run uh, pretty rigorous and disciplined supply chains and just general opera operations. And a lot of these electric companies now are five, 10, 15, 20 billion dollars, right? The level of complexity requires great expertise there. So how do you choose celebrities and influencers? Again, w when you look at the, so, you know, you used to say, you <coughs> said we used to rely on magazines. Everything's right. changed yes. now. So are consumers more influenced by, you know, by influencers and celebrities yes. than they used to? I think influencers has always been part of the business, yeah. whether it's the fashion industry or, or other spaces. But it was right? more controlled. Is that the difference uh, compared to 10 I years I think it ago? was more, you're right, it was l less spokespeople. Um, and now you have a much broader palette yeah. For us, what's critical is authenticity. So the, the concept of I'm going to write you a big check, for instance, today, and you're going to talk about us, and then tomorrow yeah. you're going to show up on a competitive brand because you got another big check, that's, we're not interested in that. Uh, we want people who have an authentic relationship. Up next, Patrice Louvet on risk-taking, gambling with the metaverse in the next 50 years. The only failure is a failure of learning. So even if we've tried and we, we, it bombed, as long as we capture the learnings and we apply them elsewhere, it was a success. More than half of Ralph Lauren's customers are women, yet they represent less than a third of sales. It's an area of the business the chief executive sees as an opportunity, as he bets on growth in women's merchandise. I continue the conversation with Patrice Louvé. What's next for Ralph Lauren? Are you going to fo focus on sleepwear? Or are there other parts that you think you can grow a lot more? Yeah, what's amazing with this brand and what Ralph has created is uh, we can actually enter a lot of spaces with, with automatic credibility. Look, we are one of the hottest restaurants in New York with the polo bar. We are looking for an opportunity for us to open one here in London. Uh, but that's, that isn't, that, that's it. a part of our ecosystem is not a, a core priority for us. Next spaces for us are winning with women. Mm -hmm. as, I, as I mentioned earlier, our his business historically has been driven by, uh, by men. Today, 56% of our customers are actually women on our website and our stores. Yeah. They represent less than 30% of our business. So that's a massive opportunity for us. And I think as we get to her, understand her better, Mm -hmm. develop the right products for her, present the products in a way that resonates with her, which may not be the same way as for men. That's a big opportunity for us. Handbags is an area as part of kind yeah. of completing the style for women is an area. And then we're looking into home. And I actually think if you, if you reflect on Ralph's approach to this space, again, he creates these environments, creates this yeah. world. You can really picture how that translates into home. So that's an area of growth for us. Lo you know, longer term, but I, I'm actually pretty excited about the perspectives there. The metaverse. Yes. Are you Are excited you the about the metaverse? I don't need, I mean, I was, and then I think now we're talking about AI, so everyone's forgotten right. about the metaverse. You're right, the media headlines <laughs> have moved on, but the consumer has not. 
which is actually very so are interesting. Are you investing in the metaverse? We are investing in the metaverse. It follows the principle I talked about earlier, which is we want to be where our consumer is. That's where the younger population is. That's where they want to engage with brands like us. We want to play a leadership role there, and I'm excited about what we were doing. We've got a partnership with Fortnite, so How important does that work? space for us. What, a partnership with Fortnite. I mean, you don't dry, do you dress the you Yeah, you can buy the, your you skin. So if you play on Fortnite, um, you can actually dress your player in the Ralph Lauren skin. And we've actually done, there's some really cool boots that we developed that you can dress your, your player with, but we've actually done a physical version of them as well. Was that quite a gamble? I mean, go, going into, yeah. you know, it's, it's brave, so it paid off, it could have backfired. True, but uh, here's where I, I go back to the roots of this company. Ralph started with a tie. We could be here 56 years later being the market leader globally of ties. Part of the DNA of this company is trying things, innovating, expanding, experimenting. So we're just staying, staying true to that. Uh, and you know, I always talk about the fact that the only failure is a failure of learning. So even if we've tried and we, we, it bombed, as long as we capture the learnings and reapply them elsewhere, it was a success. Patrice, what are you like as a leader, a risk taker? I think the, pe the people, if you ask them throughout my career how they would describe me, they would say servant leader, I really believe in the fact that I'm, my job is to set the team up as success and create the conditions for people to leverage their full potential. If I do that well, I'll be fine. I'm, uh, I think people would say listener. All right, and there's a great quote from a Greek philosopher. It's like, we have two ears and one mouth. And there's a reason for that. Um, people would say I'm a learner and constant learning, and actually Ralph is an incredible inspiration because uh, you know, based on where he is at this stage in life, he's constantly learning, and I, I use that as inspiration. Uh, I, I am a, a measured risk taker, I would say. Uh, I am not a swing for the fence risk taker, but uh, I believe in innovating, experimenting, and trying new things, and I think that's, you feel that energy inside the company today. I, I love that spirit of just trying things, and again, learning. What's a good day in, in the Louvet world? So how do you measure success? Uh, a good day for me, listen, the, where I get the greatest energy and excitement is time in the stores with our team. So uh, what do you do? Do you change things around or do you fantastic. just... No, I try to hold myself uh, from <laughs> no, doing no. that. It's very tempting, <laughs> but uh, I try to avoid doing that. No, I just listen to the stories that, that our teams tell me, both in terms of how they're engaging with customers, what we could do better in terms of the brand and product, and then also how they're building culture within their stores. And, and you're committed to the UK. Very committed to the UK, second biggest market for the company, uh, historical market for us, and great source of inspiration for Ralph. So this market's very important to us. Okay, worst day in the office. Did you have a bad day? I haven't had a lot. Obviously when the numbers aren't coming through the way you'd like them to come in, that, that never feels very good, right? Uh, but that's welcome to life in the business world. When we're not able to get the balance right between the magic and the logic, and, and the groups are not mm -hmm. communicating well, and, and that, that obviously can be frustrating. The fashion industry, one of the lovely things about it is it's very emotional. One of the challenging things about it is it's very emotional. And so it's managing people's emotions. W w were you surprised that even in this cost of living crisis, actually luxury, it just you know, does so well? Listen, I think people need to dream, right? When, when the environment is more challenging and people still need to dream. They need, to, they need someone who's going to give them hope and bring optimism, and, and I think that's the, what the best luxury companies do well. Where will you be in five years? I mean, we are, we're on an exciting journey right now as a, as a firm, both in terms of expansion geographically. We'll be stronger in Asia. We'll, uh, we'll have a, established a good presence in India. We'll be better distributed across Europe. Mm -hmm. We'll be more present in the west of the U.S. because that's actually a big white space for us. I think you'll see our women's business to be, uh, be more, more successful and larger than, than, uh, than what it is today. And then what I hope is that I'm still at the helm working closely with Ralph to bring dreams to life for all of our consumers around the world. Patrice, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Venti.